in my experience at least, you have to go through really hard things. Not only do you have to go through them, but they're required to go to the depths, to go to those hard feelings you can't face or even know are there, to really see things as they are, mm -hmm. to feel so much suffering and pain and hopelessness at times that it's actually the motivation. God can't remove what you're not ready to let go of. I am Lisa Roars, former executive coach turned podcaster and digital course creator. Just a few years ago, my typically unwavering optimism was put to the test when my autoimmune system went sideways and handcuffed my dreams to positively impact the world. Fast forward though, through years of failed experiments, dozens of doctors and countless hours of research, and I am now a healthy, thriving CEO of a business that is positively impacting the world by empowering people to exchange fear for fortitude and dis-ease for durability. I created the Sunshine Cafe podcast to give you strategies to be your best self-advocate so you can focus on the things which light you up. If you're looking for hope and encouragement to live a life you love, then you're in the right place. Let's dive in. Welcome back to the Sunshine Cafe. I'm thrilled today to have as my guest, my friend, Rebecca Gillis. Now, many of you might recognize Rebecca as a seasoned Toronto-based copywriter. She has over a decade of expertise with integrated advertising, and her achievements span across digital, social, television, print, out-of-home editorial, and radio, among others. Other people might recognize her as a talented actress and a film writer. Some have had the pleasure of laughing with her as she's done stand-up comedy acts, which is an entertaining pursuit she uses as a way to not take life too seriously. But in this episode, Rebecca graciously opens her heart and invites us behind the scenes to see the other side of a life that, from one perspective, may seem a bit glamorous. The lives we are so quick to judge from photos and online media posts rarely line up with the truth. So today, I'm honored to introduce you to a side of Rebecca Gillis that you might not know. The reality of someone who has gone through hell and back again, over and over again. But Rebecca's resilient, hope-filled attitude, grounded in a connection to her higher power, and an unwavering commitment to take her journey and all of its twists and turns to use it to help others, is extraordinary and encouraging. Let's dive into Rebecca's journey from hell to happiness with the hope that at some point in her healing journey, she might never have to repeat that cycle again. Well, welcome back. And Rebecca, I'm so happy to have you with us today. Welcome to the show. Thank you. You know, we've talked a couple different times and enjoyed some great conversations in the past. And I just know your story is really one about coming from a low point and finding the motivation and the strength and all the things that you needed to, to turn your life around. And find a brand new normal. And I think our listeners are going to be really encouraged by your story. So maybe just give them a little background about who you are and kind of what that journey looks like in your world. Sure. Thanks, Lisa. Um, yeah. So I, I guess I'll start with now. I'm nine years into recovery, uh, recovery from alcohol, drugs, food, and codependency, if you want to simplify it. <laughs> yeah among other things. And so my podcast is called Hell Happiness Repeat because in my experience, at least, you have to go through really hard things. Not only do you have to go through them, but in my experience, actually, they're required to go to the depths, to go to those hard feelings you can't face or even know are there, to really see things as they are, mm -hmm. to feel so much suffering and pain and hopelessness at times that it's actually the motivation or the starting point of um, of getting to the the higher levels of recovery, right? They say sometimes you have to go to hell to reach heaven, or you know, yeah. Um, and it, that it's not a one time thing. Like the hell I went through in my using of substances for twenty five years were necessary for me to get sober and also to help others, but it didn't stop there. And 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 then once I was in recovery and I was sober, I had to go through the hell of looking at some parts of me that I was afraid to look at or my past or my belief systems of like how the world works and how around my worth, my body, my 
everything. And so it gets deeper and deeper, but I had to go through that hell, right? Mm -hmm. And then letting go of rules and being in boxes and living small and even like my food recovery on food and binging and abusing food. I had to leave restriction and dieting and went through a 70 pound weight gain to do that, which I'm still coming out of. And I'm so happy I did that. I, I had to let go of the skinny size six. And that was maybe the most biggest hell for me that I've been <laughs> through in the, in the last nine years because I didn't know how much my body defined my worth. Mm. And I had to go through that hell to find that out. And now I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I would not trade any of this that I went through in the last, say, two or three years to go back to the size six that I may actually return to anyway, but it won't be through the same drivers or right. motivations. Yeah. A healthy path. Yeah. And then I started to see, uh, you know, I've used a, a lot of different methods and modalities and therapies and approaches spiritual, emotional, physical, mm -hmm. all of that. And um, I started to see how much it can help other people, mm -hmm. which is everything. Like carrying the message, telling people there's another way to live. There's another way out of that hell that you don't know about. That's how I was helped by others throughout yeah. my journey of nine years. And so now I help other people as I did throughout. And I, I meet people where they're at, right? And where I'm at. So today I'm teaching people things that I didn't know three years ago. Mm -hmm. And so when I speak to someone who's in that hell of whether it's a, a mother who can't stop drinking and is hiding it from people and thinks there's no way to get through a day without a drink and finds out, seeing the light come on, that actually that's not true, mm -hmm. right? And I relate, even though I'm not a mother. So yeah, so that's really right now where I, or for always, I guess, since I started recovery is how can I help others yeah. with my own experience? Yeah, that's so good. I think... There's so many of us. I think almost everybody has a addiction. Uh, some addiction topics are worse than others because they're more damaging or they're more visible or they're more debilitating. But we all have something that we go to when we're trying to fill a void in our emotional or otherwise, you know, broken lives. We just go to something. And so I love how, I love how completely open you are about your story and how you're really you're trying to reach people who are in the dark where you were and showing them a doorway to get out. And we're all kind of in that dark space until we find, oh, the door, the door's over there. I need to just go walk through that doorway and start my healing process. So, right. It's like with Sunshine Cafe and healing when you're feeling stuck. It's kind of, it's the same theme. And what I call hell, someone might call stuck or hopeless or, you know, for me, I, the words I use while I'm in it were hell. So I, that's, what, yeah. you know, Living but it's like, I'm stuck yeah, exactly. and I don't know how to get out on my own. So I, be I believe for a long time that there is no way out. And that's real hell where you're like, I, I guess I just stay here I, until I, the end. And, and it, it takes others and an awakening, whether in it's religious, spiritual, you know, there's a power beyond my best efforts mm -hmm. that I now have access to mm -hmm. that I can access anytime I want mm -hmm. through others, but also mm -hmm. through all of the thing, inner child work and going inward. Wonderful. And it knows the truth. It has the wisdom. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel alone. And that's something I didn't have. I was blocked from it. Yeah. And that's a very yeah. hopeless place to be. When you feel like you're stuck, you're living in an earthly hell, and you feel like you have no hope or no ability to fix it or change it. So exactly. when you were in those moments, I mean, you had multiple multiple paths that were kind of feeling hopeless to you. What was the pivot point for you? What allowed you to turn it around or find that motivation to get unstuck? Well, initially it was, um, again, the hell helped, which was I was drinking. I wouldn't say drinking more. When I drank, my spiritual bankruptcy was more apparent, right? Mm -hmm. I, I had no hope. I had no self-esteem. I had nothing but self-hatred and shame and guilt and uh, denial. And that's what I was working with to survive. And alcohol wasn't even working anymore. And I had a friend who'd been, he and I used to drink together and he got sober through a program and was luckily still in my life, even though he lived in the US and I live in Canada. And I, I remember him saying, I'm, I'm one year sober today. 
And I thought, oh, good for him because my denial was still in place. I could, I'm like, I don't have a real problem. I'll figure it out. Like I've been trying for 20 years and it's getting worse, but I'm sure I'll figure it out. And he moved back to Toronto. I hadn't seen him in, in person in over a decade. And he looked younger than last time I saw him. And he had a light to him, a confidence and a peace. I couldn't put my finger on it. It wasn't just that he was sober. It was, there was, And that's that, you know, that stuff that, I don't know what you call it, that power or that essence that, that I, I was like, it's very attractive. And I thought, I, I just started spending more time around him because I, was, I didn't realize at the time I wanted what he had, but I didn't know what it was. Sure. I certainly didn't want to stop drinking. I wanted mm -hmm. something else. I was like, I can't stop drinking. That was one of my beliefs. I cannot live without alcohol. So he was my window into sobriety and not just sobriety, but recovery. Like recovery is if I just stopped drinking, which I couldn't, that my life would be perfect. That's what I thought. If I can just stop drinking, lose 20 pounds, you know, a couple other external things, I'll be fine. And it's like, well, you can't, you're, you're really treating a symptom and a solution, mm -hmm. right? Like if you treat the drinking, it's like treat, treating a leaf on a branch on a tree and not looking at the root. So it's That's like a great analogy. So you drink because of all these reasons. Let's cure the drinking. Yeah. Like, okay, well, now I shop. Now what? Now I, you know, now I'm what, using drugs or work on them or, well, we'll treat those. Yeah. Like, and so uh, I, yeah, so that was my, my first window into there's something other than just not drinking, which was hell for me. Mm -hmm. I really just didn't want to be alive anymore. I, I didn't want to die because I was afraid of hurting people. That was my only real reason. And I was afraid to do it. Some part of me was holding on because I ended up giving recovery a shot thanks to this person who'd given me a year and a half exposure to it. After It took a year and a half <laughs> before I finally said, I think I'm ready. Okay. And it was really coming into rooms and spaces where people like me, who had the same shame, the same issues, the same sort of stories, the same thing I couldn't even talk about or share with another human being or even share with myself. I was in such a denial. I started mm -hmm. listening and seeing, oh my gosh, there are others like me and they're open and loving and they talk about God. And I never thought about God because I just put up a big barrier that was like, people who like God are stupid. <laughs> you know, I followed the beliefs of other people in my life that said the same thing. Sure. And to me, God I still don't define it, but I started to see what I first saw in that friend mm -hmm. that I couldn't put my finger on it. The light, mm -hmm. the the peace, the um, the truth. There's something there that it's it, just looking at him. I'm like, there's another way, and it's it's going to be okay, mm -hmm. even though you're sure it's not. And mm -hmm. uh, I had to do some work and some work with others, like helping me through looking at myself, looking honestly at what was happening, what my life. The, the nature of the um, the source of where all this is coming from and how I was co trying to cope with things that no longer serve me. Mm -hmm. And there was something going on in the background other than me, bigger than myself or this person or this organization that helped me that was just in the works. And it mm -hmm. turned into trust and peace. And I remember I never went more than three days without drinking since I was 12. And I remember the first week, maybe, or two weeks being like, how am I sober? Mm -hmm. And I'm not struggling to be sober. There are those moments, but like, right. why is it peaceful? Why is it? And a month in, I was like, well, I haven't thought about having a drink. Wow. After That's... drinking since I was 12 and I was 38. I was <laughs> like, how? Yeah. That to me is a higher power or yes. God working, which is, as a mentor said, she used to hold a pen in front of me really tightly and say, Try and take this pen out of my hand. And I tried, and of course I couldn't. And she said, God can't remove what you're not ready to let go of. Mm. So you're not removing your obsession with alcohol. You're surrendering it to a power greater than yourself. And that mm. power is just dying to come. Like my God for me is a divine mother. It, it changes all the time. Mm -hmm. And she wants to love me. And it's years to, to be able to envision a loving God. Yeah. Um. It, it took time. It was a development and it took time. But it I trusted this a relationship. It does take time. you got to slowly work into that relationship. It just doesn't immediately show up. Exactly. So it was 
it was such a process and it was involved therapy and this kind of group organization and lots of mentors, lots of fellow people who are, who walk the same path, maybe different parts on the path, mm -hmm. which is like whether we're doing that in a podcast course or in recovery and sobriety, it's, it's the same thing of like fellows. And I remember going to church services and being like, it's the same stuff. Like there's <laughs> love and there's connection and support and a wanting to help others, mm -hmm. which I I was always helpful, but I I just saw myself as so limited and so shameful that I couldn't receive love. I couldn't give love. I couldn't, um, I could help, but it was always trying to get something in return, like approval or, and it's like those blocks lift. And for me, authentic self is part of God, right? Like God wants me to be who I can be. And it's not that I have to be created. It's that I have to be unblocked because I'm already in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now I access that through. For me, I do a lot of inner child work, meaning that word gets thrown around a lot. But there's this little girl in me that was hurt and traumatized and I abandoned for so many years and had no relationship with. And today I have a relationship with her that's very close and she's wise and she's mm -hmm. also a child. There's very many versions of me and I had to slowly develop a relationship with myself. Like, what is it I like? What? What? What are the things that bring me joy? I had no idea. Alcohol, cocaine, like, you know, someone's like, approval. What else? <laughs> Success. Yeah. Food. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Food, um, birthday cake, eating mm -hmm. it in the bathroom when no one's around. Like, <laughs> so um, I, I didn't trust that I knew what I liked. And that work with reconnecting with self, which to me is God, it's kind of a, whether it's a trinity or a. I developed a relationship with myself and they, what do they say? How do you build self-esteem through esteemable acts, mm. taking care of myself, showing up for others, doing this hard work, looking at feelings and thoughts and memories and traumas that I had completely just pushed out of my mind Yeah, because I thought it was too painful. Of course, that's why I drank, right? Because drinking is a great denial in, in liquid form, right? Yeah, it's escape, a great escape. Yeah, oblivion. I wanted to go to oblivion. And I see that with people who still drink where it's like, they can't be alone with their own thoughts. They can't, there's too much. And also the more you drink, it's not like alcohol is the reason, but it makes things, it's like putting gasoline on a fire, right? Like it, alcohol didn't cause all the things, but it contributed to them and it kept me in the cycle, the hell mm -hmm. of see you're not, see what a piece of you know what you are mm -hmm. by all of the things you've been doing. Look how you treat yourself. Look at you hung over again. Look at you not showing up to work. Yeah. That was the only voice I had in the end, yeah. which was like, you should kill yourself. Like, really, yeah. that's over and over. Yeah. That's the voice of evil. And we all know, those who know that voice, know that is absolutely not of God. Those are all the thoughts directly from evil. Yeah, and some people call it the addict or the voice or the other wolf, you know, like, mm -hmm. which wolf are you feeding today? Yeah. Or my mentor at the time when I was new said, every day just think, which actions am I taking that bring me closer to God and which actions am I taking that take me away from God, mm -hmm. which is gentle. It's not like, are you a bad girl or a good girl today? Right. It's like, it's yeah. um, more of a continuum instead of a on or off. Right. I don't know if you've heard this and I don't know if I'm getting it right, but I was told that sin is also an archery term because mm -hmm. for me thinking I'm the ultimate sinner and I'm not worthy because of that. Um, Sin is, I, I believe, was an archery term as well that means off the mark. Yeah. Yeah. So that's so much more gentle, which is I'm off the mark I'm or I'm off the beam. I'm off when I go to people pleasing or to substances or to start listening to the voice again that tells me either you're not good enough or you need to fight and try and get everything you can out of the world because everyone's against you. You know, all these things that I'm just off the mark. And I learned all through all of these therapies, techniques, and all the stuff that I do and getting closer to God that, that just get back on the mark. And when I'm on the mark, I'm clear, I'm trusting, I'm useful, mm -hmm. I'm purposeful, yeah. and I'm connected to myself and others and God. So then and in the morning when I remember, I say, God, please show me where I can be useful today. Yeah. And I, I remember someone saying once in a workshop that it's like saying to God, spirit, I give you consent to have your way with me, to mm. do what you will with me, to, because then I don't have to know and decide. 
because ego can come in and say, oh, I know where I'll be helpful. And even, I don't know about you, making a podcast has been very challenging in that regard because I find it very hard to focus on the helping part of a podcast mm -hmm. without the ego taking me over to the success, the numbers, the monetizing potential. And whenever that takes over, I don't want to do it mm -hmm. because I can feel it coming from the wrong place. Yeah. So I have to come back to God, where, where do I focus today? And it's remember you can help and how you can carry the message to more people. Yeah. That's a, that's a beautiful way to do it. And that's one of my prayers, actually, most days is, you know, bring the right people into my path to interview and let me interview people that will bring a message to whoever is out there who needs to hear it and use me the way that you need to be, not need, he doesn't need me at all, but <laughs> use me the way that I could be used to make the world just a little bit better for even just one person and letting go of the rest of it. If it's if it's successful, if it reaches millions of people, hooray. If it reaches a reaches hundred people, hooray. It's a hundred people that I might have encouraged. Yeah. Lovely way of looking at it. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Thank you. Yeah. Your story, I think, does the same. You know, it doesn't, does it matter if we reach millions and billions of people? Well, as you said, if you're only looking at the income or the, the dollar side of it, then maybe it does. But if you're looking at it and coming at it from the approach of, I really have a heart and a desire to help others and show them the door when they're sitting in the darkness or show them the light when they're stuck and need encouragement. It doesn't matter if you reach two people. It's two people you helped. And that's the beauty. That's so true. And I thank you for that reminder because I, I know every year I try to reach out to some people. around My, my sober date is December 26, 2014. Ooh, nice. And it's a very popular time of year for drinking problems. and things coming to a head, you know, or people mm -hmm. just giving sure. like I did. And, and I just, that surrender was, I had one glass of wine on Boxing Day and said, I think I've had enough. And I was like, but I, I can't not drink. I was like, I think I'm willing to go and try something else. And, and it's true, like I will post something and, and eight months later, I'll hear from someone that I haven't talked to in a decade who said, I haven't stopped thinking about that post. And I forget about it because I'm just doing my thing. And and you don't know where who it's going to reach, and that's one person. Or when I work one-on-one -on -one with somebody and seeing the light come on and seeing someone who really believes there's no way out, mm -hmm. the stuck that you talk about, you know, in your podcast, um, you start to believe that stuck is just, it's the only way of living. Yeah. And, that, and then what do you do? Well, you drink or you whatever, you eat, you, mm -hmm. you perpetuate that same cycle. And... Uh, there's nothing. I was thinking that the other day, sitting with someone alone. There's no money involved. There's no audience. And it, it just lights me up sitting there helping <laughs> someone who's like, today, you may be the only person. And, and I don't think, begin to say that I'm the only person who can help someone. But today, you may be the only person who helps the light come on. Yeah. Because you're present and you're sober and you're available. Yeah. That's so much easier than thinking, how are you going to have a thousand followers by this time? You know, it's like. Totally. It, yeah. It's yeah. grounding. Mm -hmm. It is grounding. And I think it's energizing when you get out of your own self, this barrel we put around ourself and our we're so myopic that it's all about us. And when we yeah. start reaching out and being, I guess, courageous enough to use our hurts and our hurdles to become somebody else's hope, then all of a sudden the things that we thought were the worst thing in life or the hell, as you say, ends up becoming the hope that someone else really needed. So, and I think, you know, for our listeners that are out there, I think there's somebody out there right now listening that's saying, yeah, I feel stuck. I feel like I could never proceed without, you know, fill in the blank, whatever addiction item it is, whether it's you know, it could be pornography, it could be video games, it could be food, it could be drugs, it could be alcohol, it could be a combination of all of that. But there is hope. You know, you saw your friend who came back and looked completely transformed due to the sobriety as well as finding that light of the Holy Spirit and Jesus kind of in there working in his life. And that is the power we need to tap into to do something we can't do on our own. And that's the surrender piece that you mentioned so well. I love the analogy of holding on, gripping so tightly onto that pencil because 
<laughs> sometimes I feel like I grip onto those hurts and hurdles so hard. And then, and then I, I set them down, I let go just enough to set them down at the feet of Jesus and walk away. But then I grab them up and I walk away. You know, I take them with me. Yes. <laughs> Instead of leaving them and just surrendering them. That's a great word about we have to surrender in order to heal. Yeah, it's not easy to surrender, but it's a much easier job than, you know, when they say quit playing God. What that means is like I'm doing the work of something much more powerful and better equipped mm -hmm. than I am. So it's like I think if I'm not a commercial pilot, if I am a passenger on a plane and I do my part as a passenger. But if I get on a plane and say, you know what, actually, I'm going to fly the plane today. <laughs> That's kind of how I feel when I'm taking on, for example, Today, I can say, what's my role? I'm going to be on Lisa's podcast and speak to her for an hour and get, you know, inspired by her and hopefully help someone versus the God part is, what's this look like in five years? What am I going to do? Who do I, or I start thinking about the world and how to fix it or how to hate it or whatever. <laughs> I'm getting, I'm, I'm, if I'm anywhere outside of right now, I'm in God's territory, which is tomorrow, an yeah. hour from now. A year from now. And so there's such a nice piece in coming back to the present and saying, this is my only role right now, my yeah. only purpose. Yeah. Like Eckhart Tolle, who I, I love listening to, and he says, he's a course that, of course, I bought on <laughs> finding your life's purpose. Mm -hmm. And the first half of the course, it's almost annoying at first, is he said, your primary purpose is what you're doing right in this moment. Mm. And I'm like, well, the ego wants a bigger so then yeah, that like, what, how do I prepare for tomorrow? Come on, let's move on. Right. Yeah, I want to be successful and change the world. And I want to be the next yeah. Eckhart Tolle. It's like, and, and he talks about that with the ego. His ego died and he needed to be the most brilliant man in the room mm. until his ego died. And then ironically, he became Eckhart Tolle and doesn't care. <laughs> like the one that we know now, you know? Yeah. 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 There's scripture. Actually, I love that. It talks about a couple of scriptures that have come to mind, actually, as you've been talking, but one in particular about how don't worry about tomorrow. Today has enough trouble to deal with. It's something I'm paraphrasing. But it's like, yeah, there's, I have enough problems today to deal with. I don't need to worry about tomorrow. We'll deal with that tomorrow. Just staying in the present and being with those that we love in the moment of what we're working on and how we're being used to help others and in the process, help ourselves. Exactly. Cause, and also the present is the only time that actually exists. Mm -hmm. Like there's mm -hmm. no other time that exists and we spend all of our time living in yesterday and tomorrow. Yeah. And I know see that in meditation where a lot of my meditation is just getting present. Yeah. Or if I'm in fear, looking around the room and saying, a, a mentor taught me this, like actually doing a 360 view of your room, which actually helps your brain. And I may not be explaining this properly, but that tells you you're safe, like your liz lizard brain. You are actually safe right now. There's no threat. And then just relaxing into that presence, which is my mind may be thinking tomorrow's a crisis, but right now I'm safe and everything's okay. Yeah. And then from there, I can operate usefully because the only thing I have control over is right now. Yeah, so true. And then I, and then I look at what's my role today. And I have many roles. Like I'm feeding my cat now and I'm playing with her. My role is a cat owner playing with a cat right now. Now I'm a guest on a podcast, which is amazing. I love, because I love you. I love, I love doing this. <laughs> And then later my role will be brushing my teeth. It's it's so simple. And the ego, at least in my experience, hates that because it's threatening. It's like, I'm not a toothbrusher. I'm a famous <laughs> guru. Yeah. I just haven't done it yet. You know? <laughs> right, right. I'm working up to it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There is a quote from a movie. And for those of you who have seen the movie, you're going to totally know what it is. But I love it. And it's so appropriate for this conversation. And the quote says something like, the past is history. The future is a mystery. But today is a gift. That's why we call it a present or the present. I love oh, I thinking love about that. Yeah, that it's a present. It's a gift. It's a, the now is a gift. And for those who didn't make the connection, it's Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> Quotes by Kung Fu Panda. But anyway, I just thought that quote, uh, it just opened my eyes to the fact that today is a gift. And I know plenty of people from this past year who don't have the gift of today because they're gone. So yep. let's enjoy the gift of today and don't spend the gift of today worrying about tomorrow when we don't even have any idea what's going to be in that day. 
I love that. And that too is something I practice when I, I'm probably still in yesterday and tomorrow 80% of the time, but if I've made a 20% difference in nine years, I think that's a lot. Yeah. And it's so true because there's some quote, it's something about we squ- we squander the hours yeah. that we could have lived. And I had a therapist who said that, you know, there is truth to when you're constantly in the, she called them the chugga chuggas, where your your <laughs> mind is just going and going. And, and Eckhart Tolle says that we, it's a human epidemic we have of overthinking, addiction yeah. to thinking with no resolution. We don't solve anything. We just think. And, and we miss everything. I had this big fear of of missing life and running out of time, especially when I was newly sober, because I had to look at, again, the hell of all of the opportunity, opportunities I wasted. You know, I never had kids. What could I have been if I had not been drinking through mm-hmm. high school and university? I still was, quote unquote, successful, but yeah. what could I have found or been or discovered? And I was so focused on the years I'd squandered. Yeah. And she said, ironically, or I don't know if that's the right term for it, but she said, in thinking about it all the time, you're squandering hours now. You're actually wasting your life now Yeah. in being in the thinking. And so I use that if I'm exercising now. I love looking in the mirror when I'm running on the treadmill. And I, I really try to be present, like in the workout, feel the sweat, feel the breathing, look at the people around you in the room. So I didn't miss the workout. Yeah. Or walking down the street and being like, I'll be thinking about the world or the government or what's going to happen or how am I going to make money? Or, and I just land. And I see it, I always say it's like an elevator where the thinking, you just allow the elevator to shift down to your body, your heart, and your stomach, where the truth is in God. And just focus on your breathing because you can't focus on your breathing and think at the same time, which I've tried and you can't. I learned that from Eckhart Tolle as well. So I just say, am I breathing? And I bring it into my chest and then the thoughts stop and I can take in what's around me and it becomes beautiful. Like walking down King Street in Toronto with a bit of snow, I'm like, this is magical. And like the gift you said, like walking to work or walking to my doctors is a gift suddenly, not something I don't even, a pain in the arse. (laughs) And also something, or just something I just miss entirely. Yeah. Yes, there's so many of those gifts all around us. The the sparkle on the snow, the the morning sunrise, and there's so many of those kind of moments where I'll ask someone at, well, before when I was in the corporate world, they'd be like, "Hey, did you see the sunrise this morning?" They'd be like, ah, "No, ah. but we we get so focused on." You know, there's those times when you end up jumping in your car and driving somewhere, and by the time you get to where you are, you don't even remember the drive because your mind yes. was so focused on whatever it was you were thinking that. You weren't even in the present enough to see the drive, which makes me a little concerned about what's happening on the roads. But anyway, you know, oh, totally. All the things that were missing around us, all the, the the birds and the sun and the just all these little I call them just little gifts, little the way little ways God is just showing off, trying to get our attention. Yes, and you know, it's just like He's just like, hey, I'm right here. Just take take a moment to notice me. I'm right here, giving you this beautiful bird to see or this beautiful sunset or this beautiful ocean or this beautiful tree or all the little gifts that are around us that we can't notice, like you said, unless we let the elevator drop and just breathe into the moment. Yeah. And it's like with food, for instance, which I know you and I've talked about briefly in the past. I used to think the only way to enjoy food is to eat all of it. And as my food, I had a food coach and mentor who said, um, you're not enjoying it. She said, eat food in a way that you enjoy. And I said, I can't do that because the way I enjoy food is 50 cheesecakes and a pizza in bed. She said, you're not enjoying that for a second. You're not tasting it. You're not with it. You're thinking about the calories and, oh my God, I did it again. And there's the shame and the fear and the, and the oh my God, my body can't change. I can't gain weight. Now the thinking, she said, you're missing the whole thing. And for six years on and off, I just didn't eat anything that I used or abused. And I, so I didn't eat deep fried foods or sugar or desserts. And I missed out on all of that. The that trigger foods. Yeah. Okay. All my trigger foods, I, at least for four and a half years straight, I did not touch them. I did not participate in any food behaviors that were triggering, like mm. eating off of somebody else's plate or eating seconds or eating at night or eating in bed. And all that stuff worked for a while. And again, that was my first hell with food was giving up, it was like surrendering to the restriction. Mm-hmm. That felt peaceful at and I needed it. And then to get the body I want finally and be with that for a while and have peace. And then 
the next howl was letting go of that restriction. And when I had to start eating whatever I wanted, I was like, I can't. Because I know, again, we use the past to dictate the future and ignore the present. So I say, I know how this goes because it's always gone this way. I'm going to be 500 pounds in a year if I, quote unquote, allow myself to enjoy food. And that took two years of, the, again, the hell. And then coming into the light, a very slow process while gaining all this weight and being terrified every hour. I can't gain another pound. I can't gain. And today, because of the work I've done, I can enjoy food where I can have a piece of chocolate. And it's like, oh, my God, that's so delicious. <laughs> and because you're with God and in the present, you know when you've had enough because you actually enjoyed it. Yeah. Like you're like, hmm, that was delicious. I can have it whenever I want. I've had enough and now I'm going to go do something else. Yes. Yeah. It's like, but being present with everything, food, sex, um, spending time with another. Like I, I st again, I'm still a huge work in progress as we all are, but I mean, I guess Eckhart Tolle apparently is present 24 <laughs> seven. I don't know how anyone does that, but that's a good measure of what is possible. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it's a practice, right? Or when I was walking on the beach or sorry, along the lake and uh, I stopped and just hung out with the trees. And I was like, I <laughs> love, love trees. Who knew I love trees? <laughs> or sitting in the dog park by myself. I'm like, who knew I loved sitting in dog parks alone when before I couldn't sit still for a second or even be in my own skin. Now I can sit and be. What does it say? We're, we're great human doings. We're terrible human beings. We're mm -hmm. not good at being. We're yeah. good at doing. It's a really good yeah. phrase too. Yeah. And it takes some exploring to figure those things out. And, you know, I, I think everything's learned. Everything. I think sitting still is learned. I think our, learning about ourselves is learned. I think self-control is learned. And so if we've never had a good experience, if we never taught our children how to sit still, of course they're going to look like they're attention deficient. They've never had training in how to just sit still. And yep. If we've never taught ourselves how to stop and pause and just be and enjoy the surroundings and enjoy the person we're with and not have to be on our phone and not have to be doing something and just be, we, if that's a learned thing. So you, we, we may have to start with just a five-minute exercise every day. I'm just going to be for five minutes without my phone, without anything. Then the next day, go to 10 or maybe three days later, try to 10 uh, and see if you can do it for 10 minutes. But I think all of these little pieces of the puzzle and controlling our own desires, including self-restrictions, is learned. I have to practice it. Yeah. And it is a practice. It's like walking on a tightrope, which I don't know how to do. But <laughs> I found that like when I started practicing presence, which is like what you're describing, not only all the distract, what's the biggest distraction I have the most access to, my mind. Mm. My mind will come in and be like, cool. That's why people say we can't, I can't, I'm a terrible meditator. Mm. I can't meditate. And it's learned through doing. Mm -hmm. And everyone's going to start as a terrible meditator. And I remember when I was, I used to listen to Eckhart, um, his meditations, because it was my way of practicing. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I could be present for three seconds, literally three yeah. seconds. And it would be doing that thing where you drop into your body, focus on your breathing and He's like, take something in the room and just focus on it. And Michael Singer, who wrote The Untethered Soul, talks about this too, where you can actually take something in without even defining it in your mind. So he'll use the example of, say you see a beautiful flower and your mind goes, oh, that's a nice flower. And it narrates the whole experience and ruins it. That's a nice flower. Oh, it's orange. It's kind of orange. Like, oh, those pants, those orange pants. Oh, those are on sale. I should actually, you know what? Suddenly I'm, I'm on the phone looking up the pants to see if they're on sale. <laughs> and I missed the flower. And I remember he used that analogy or that anecdote. And uh, I started to practice. Like I'd look at my fan while it's running. And I would just look at it. And it's just a fan. I'm pointing at it right now. I'd be in bed. And I remember I'm like, I'm taking in this fan and there's no thought. There's no sound. It's completely just present. Wow. And then I, he's like, he basically in the meditation says, see that, that you just do all the time and that's presence that's all you need to to be right right but you didn't give up that's i think a key point in the fact that you started trying to be present and mindful 
you said you couldn't do it for more than three seconds, but you didn't stop. Oh, you're, oh, I can't do mindfulness. It's, you know, I'm no good at it. No, <laughs> no one's going to be good at anything when they first try it. I think that's the fallacy that anybody thinks yep. eating well is going to go well the first time or fasting is going to go well the first time or fill in the blank. Anything you try for the first time is going to pretty much be either overwhelming, completely new, foreign, uncomfortable, hate it, you stink at it, you name it. That's what happens yeah. when you try something new. And if we level set our brains to say, that's the expectation. So when I go in and do a first yoga class, I've never done yoga before, that could get my body in that contorted state or whatever it might be. Yeah, great. That's exactly what it's supposed to be for my first yoga class. Great. I, yeah. I get a win. I get a gold star for trying. So I think anyone listening, if you've ever tried these mindfulness practices, if you've ever tried moving into an area that you're uncomfortable with because it's brand new, hooray, you did well. You moved into something new and it's supposed to be uncomfortable. That's the point. Yes. And that's, again, what I would call hell. Like, maybe I overuse hell, but I'm like, <laughs> just trying to be present and not being able to is, an, it drives you nuts, right? And then you see these core beliefs people either develop early on or create in themselves, which is I'm not a meditator. I would say most of my friends who don't do this sort of work um, just say, oh, I don't meditate. I can't. And, and I'm, I giggle because I, I was that way too which is we all feel that way. And just like, I can't stop. Oh, I, I can't stop drinking. I will never stop drinking. And um, they don't try things or people who won't start working out. My trainer said this, he goes, you know how many people, especially guys, they won't start training with a trainer until they're in shape because <laughs> they don't think how I, I'm not going to work out until I'm in shape. And it, and that's the th same thing with getting sober. It's like, I'll stop drinking when I'm healthier. Well, that's a little, and, and like those that you're talking about, those tiny, if you have a, a one second of presence, you just did what Eckhart Tolle says, it's the only meditation a human being needs. Mm -hmm. And I remember doing one, two, three, and I, 30 seconds, a minute, you know. Yeah. And uh, it's fun. It becomes fun because it is like the tightrope. Like we're like, oh, you there. Oh, I thought, okay. Oh, oh, I'm back <laughs> on. <laughs> and uh, or I see this with some people I work with now in recovery where, so I'm, I can't stop drinking. And I said, see, that's the lie that will keep you drinking. Yeah. And you're afraid to look at all the things underneath the drinking. Mm -hmm. And so you keep drinking and it makes it worse and worse. And this person who they all blow my mind, seeing people wake up where it's like, oh, she would think I'm only perfect if I don't drink. Mm -hmm. I'm only a good mom if I don't drink. I'm only, yeah. I said, forget about trying not to drink because you've tried that for years and you're powerless over it. What about trying something else? Like, pausing and breathing in the morning before you pick up that drink, calling someone and connecting. And I'm seeing this change where she says, I came home after we met and I didn't keep drinking. Hmm. She, and it wasn't her last drink, but she didn't. She goes, what was that? And I say, trying to define God for someone who's new. I don't try to do that, but I use my own experience, which is I use their experience. What was that? Why did you do something different that mm -hmm. you've never done before? Yeah. And she goes, I it's blowing my mind. She goes, and then the next day she goes, why did I call you instead of having a second glass of wine? And I said, notice how it has nothing to do with drinking or not drinking. You called me. And then I see self-esteem come in and self-care. And I'm going to go do something nice for myself now. And, and I said, see, the fact that you can't explain it or understand it, that's a higher power. Right. And, it's not, and I said, has this ever happened to you in your drinking career? No. I say, how did it happen? Tell me. Because that shows people, people don't like talking about God and higher power. It's lofty or it's scary. And it's like, if you've never been able to do this till this moment, why suddenly now? Right. And they don't have an answer because it's not under their control. Mm -hmm. So it's learning what a higher power is through experiencing. I said, I can talk about my higher power forever to you. It gives you an idea and an example, but you, you'll know it when you experience it. And it's through taking... That hell, all that hell that you went through and using it, right? Like, I wouldn't be in a spiritual place at all if I weren't an alcoholic mm -hmm. because I wouldn't have pursued any of this. Yeah, yeah. It was the depth that took me there. Of Like they say in my world, like, we had to have the desperation of the dying to surrender. It took the desperation of the dying. And uh, I love that because I'm not going to, or some one guy said it, this is what brings us to God's table. I don't just wander over to God's table. Hey, is there any seats here? I'm bored. <laughs> you know, it was, I was brought there 
through the, the hell. And then, you know, and one recovering and healing from one thing, as you know, I'm sure leads to recovering somewhere else, like in another area. Yes. So yeah. we clear, like you put the drink down. Wow. I'm sober a month. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now watch. And that's when you explain to someone, mm -hmm. when you get sober, it, it has nothing to do with alcohol. Yeah. Good point. It's really like you put the drink down one day at a time and then your whole life changes and it has nothing to do with drinking. Right. But to ask me that 10 years ago and I'd say, I just need to stop drinking and that's it. My life will be fine once I stop drinking. And there's a whole beautiful life and spiritual life behind that. That It's like a, it's like a surprise party. Like, oh, okay, you're going to see it. You'll, you have no idea. You're going to be blown away <laughs> if yeah. you keep going yes. through the hell. Yeah. Through the, go through it and come out the other side. Yeah. That's so, yeah. so good. So good. You know, now, I, I don't know why, but so many scriptures are coming through my head today, but there is a scripture about that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. And it, it wow. brings me back to the point of desperation. Rich people, um, you know, in its very general sense, have most of their needs met. They don't have any, mm -hmm. you know, now that there's a lot of rich people who have actually a lot of addictions and are living in their own hell for different reasons. But it's that that point of you have to reach desperation before you're ready and open and willing to release it and to su surrender it to the Lord and see where God will bring you through it. And then exactly. when you get through it, it's such a it's such a eye opener. Such when you all of a sudden feel like you're tapping into the power of God in you. It's it's like you said, it's really hard to explain if you've not experienced it. But when you have, it's it really lights you up. That's so true what you're saying too about rich. Because for me, I mean, I was never rich, but I had my needs met externally, sure. mm -hmm. which showed me for a long time, I don't have a problem because I have a condo. I don't have a problem because I have a job. I have a family. I have friends. Mm -hmm. I'm doing comedy. I'm traveling. Mm -hmm. But what my desperation came from, I didn't lose my things. I lost myself. Mm -hmm. And I was confused because I was like, I'm not on the streets. I'm not even a daily drinker. Why am I how can I be an alcoholic? How can I be someone who needs recovery yeah. when I have all these things? And it, that awakening or the truth came in, which was I had to be shown through a lot of hell is you're, I love what a woman said once a speaker I listened to. She said, I didn't lose my job. I didn't lose my husband. I didn't lose my home. I lost my dignity. I lost my hope and I lost mm -hmm. myself. Which those and other those, things, the first things you mentioned, have no value if you don't have those last things. You don't have no dignity. Right. You don't have hope. If you don't have those things, it doesn't matter if you have a home or a husband or a really great job or lots of money. If you have no dignity, no hope, the rest of that, that's why you see people in Hollywood who end up taking their own lives because they've got all of their needs met and all the money and no community, no sense of self-worth, no sense of... You know, they're not giving anything back to the world and they don't feel like they're valuable. That's yeah. a hopeless place to be. That's a hell on earth. Yeah, I think of that like Elton John. I don't know if you saw Rocket Man. I loved it. And he he's also sober, obviously. But he And he had every like, food, love addict, food addict, alcohol, drugs. And I mean, here's, here's an example. He, who, he couldn't have any more than he had. He had everything. Mm -hmm. But again, he didn't have, he couldn't feel, he couldn't receive, he didn't feel lovable. Mm -hmm. He didn't feel he was worthy and he didn't. And the time, one of the richest people in the, in the entertainment industry. And I remember the showing in the film, like buying things and it's not working and binging on food and it's not working. And, and Sia talks about that. I love Sia, the, the singer. Mm -hmm. And she said, I have millions of dollars and it doesn't matter at all. And I love hearing that because the people who have it or Theo Vaughn, like they're, who are sober, they're telling you, I have what you think you need, and it means nothing. Mm -hmm. So don't worry about it. Like $10 million will not make you happy. Right. And if you're seeking that, you're on the wrong path. And also what I learned, at least in the world of substance abuse or any, any addiction, um, whatever you put before your recovery, you will lose. So not only will it not serve you, but you won't keep it. You know, the people who are hopeless and lost and miserable they lose their, their husbands and wives. They lose their house eventually. Mm -hmm. Often they lose their life and just bypass all of that, right? Which Elton John tried many times, you know? So, yeah. 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 It's really, it's not the message that society tells us or that the marketplace tells us or corporate world tells us. That's not the yeah. message you're hearing. 
But that is the truth. That is raw, real truth. And there are more and more people knowing the truth. And again, I sorry, I don't know why I'm talking about Eckhart Tolle so much, but he he's been a huge part of my spiritual journey, I guess. And he talks about that. He said we're we're awakening right now. Uh, mm-hmm. There's an awakening happening, and it's slow, mm-hmm. and it's never been more necessary. He said there have been messengers trying to to bring us the message we needed to hear, but we've never been more ready to hear it mm-hmm. because we're at we're at the end. Like we're, like we're either going to awaken or we're going to die as a species. As a and yeah. um, I love that because he said, look around, people are awakening, and a lot of people are really clinging to staying asleep. Mm-hmm. So you're seeing both. Yeah. And I re- I saw that like when I went to see him, I thought I'm at in a theater or a stadium of like 5,000 people who are here to see a spiritual speaker in a mainstream place that this is what he's talking about. Like there are m- many more people waking up and mm-hmm. seeking a spiritual solution. And I think young people hopefully are doing more of that because we're waking up. And I that's what I think too when I feel overwhelmed. Just be one of the people who's awake today. Oh, that's a good, that's a good word. Because I fall asleep. It's like we're awake and we fall asleep again and we forget and then we wake up again. So when I turn to, I need to make a million dollars a year or I hate the government or I need to go shopping, you know, I've fallen asleep again, thinking those things will serve me. And then I wake up again and coming back to what I, you call God, it's always there. And it's like, oh, I'm awake again. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, plugged in to the right thing. Right. Because we have to be plugged in to yeah. the source. Yeah, for sure. That's so, so, so true. Well, for, for people out there that are maybe where you were a few years ago and are feeling like they can't take that step, they can't move, there's no way. They've tried it a hundred times. They're not going to be able to change. What advice would you have for them to just take that first step? What would be that one first pivot point that you would in- encourage them to to try yeah well the first thing i'd say is that's amazing if you've tried everything because for me at least if i have anything else to try i'll probably do that first mm-hmm. like i'll i won't drink on weekdays or i'll only drink beer not vodka or <clears throat> i won't hang out with certain people you know mm-hmm. uh if you're somewhere where you really feel truly stuck like you don't have another option Look at, are you trying the same things over and over again? And how are they working for you? Mm-hmm. That's the honesty I had to look at. I've tried all of it. I've tried counseling. I've tried the therapy. I've tried whatever it is. And um, the first honest thing is, is it working? If it isn't, do you need help? Would it be nice to have some help with this? Mm-hmm. And do you believe that there are people out there who've been where you are, who've gotten the help they need? Then that have what you want. Mm. Anyone. I mean, I could say Russell Brand. Like, I mean, there's just so, I mean, that's the beauty too, is it's everywhere now. Yeah. Um, people who've recovered. And if that's true, go ask them what they do and try it. And that remember that whatever you're dealing with, whether it's drinking, drugging, sexing, whatever, shopping, um, you never have to drink again and you never have to do it alone. Yeah. Those are probably two things that. If you're like me, you you won't believe to be true where you are right now. And that there are people everywhere who not only want are willing to help, it's the greatest joy in their life and it keeps other people sober and recovered, right? It's carrying the message. So I'm somebody you can reach out to. Um, and there are millions of others. And whatever you've gone through, you're not alone. Someone's gone through the same or worse. Whatever you've done to yourself mm-hmm. or others, someone's done it. And, you know, I say, I go to these meetings and I was saying to a girl the other day, she comes to the meetings and she's drunk and she goes, I'm like, but you still showed up and went to this meeting, the spiritual meeting. And I said to her, do you know the three women in this program who've helped me the most and mentored me the most all showed up drunk to meetings when they were new. (laughs) And so, and she see her going, oh my God, for the first time probably ever, just in that sentence, she doesn't feel completely alone. And that's the thing. We are no longer alone. The lie, the uh, dark side, it's going to say, no, no, you are alone. And no one's ever done what you've done. And you're, you're so far behind everyone else. You should just drink, die, whatever. Uh, yeah. 
So yeah, reaching out, that was a bit long-winded, sorry, but that reaching out for help and saying, all you have to say is, I can't, I don't know what to do. Is that true? Ask for help. It's everywhere. And don't be shy because you can't afford to be. And (laughs) anybody you reach out to will be happy to help you. And if they're not, the next person will. And that's why I want to make myself available. And I know just one person probably know 5,000 people like me that I could call Hmm. and say, here, they'll help you. You don't want to talk to someone you know, talk to a stranger. That's what I did. Sometimes it's easier (laughs) that way. True. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love that. And no, you could you, you could be long-winded on that one for another 10 minutes. That's just such a, <laughs> a good truth for people to realize um, that we're not alone, that there are people who have been there, done that, and they can help you with the tools and help you walk that walk that path out of that dark cave, through the door, into a life you love. Yeah. And also that, again, going back to the hell, the hell you're in right now is actually necessary. Mm-hmm. It It not only will it be the catalyst to what your little mind, my little mind thinks is, I'll just stop drinking or I'll just stop this and life will be good. It's like, no, you'll have a whole life you couldn't imagine on the other side. And wherever hell you've been in, you're going to help someone one day who's been in that, who's in the same hell and only you can understand it. Yeah. And I've had that where I've had things I used to be so ashamed of and drink over, things I'd done, places I'd been, Mm -hmm. mistakes I'd, you know, and I've helped so many women who said, I've done this. I said, so did I. Yeah. And they say, you did? Really? Oh, I did worse than that. <laughs> and I say it without shame, which they see possible for the shame to lift. And you're not treating alcoholism. You're treating shame, trauma, um, st- core beliefs that are stuck. And a lot of them are subconscious. So how do you, tr- how do you treat them consciously Yeah, and superficially? That's the hell part. Get it. Let's get into it. Let's. My friend mentor said, when you were in that food thing where you left your abstinence and your restriction and started gaining the weight, she said, you were almost, you were dragged behind a truck. Like, that's what it was like for months and months and months, just dragged behind a truck. And every pound you gained was that lesson and the teacher that you needed. She said, nothing gets your attention. Someone so addicted to being thin to be loved and so feeling worthless without that and no one feeling that way since she was 12 nothing's going to get your attention like 70 pounds <laughs> oh my god and 70 pounds was my biggest latest hell and it also taught me i was 70 pounds heavier and happy and felt attractive i used to think my life will start when i lose weight and i finally lost weight and i was like life's good and it's like well don't touch that cookie don't touch that don't do this. Don't do that. Live small. And I'd sit there staring at my body and be like, it can't change. It can never change. Well, I'm aging. It's going to change. No, no, no. And I realized my body was my higher power. Mm. Wow. And it had replaced the food. So you just anyway, now I'm going on to a, yeah. Oh, that's good. No, it's good. It's so good. I mean, when at, at First, it was the alcohol, and you were kind of worshiping that, and then you saw the food, and you're worshiping that, and then you got rid of the food, and now you're worshiping the body. And the problem is, like you said, you have to get to the root of the tree, not just deal with that one leaf. Get to the root of the cause so you can enjoy food, and you can enjoy living and not feel like you're one step away from failure. Exactly. And also, too, with higher powers, like we have a lot of them. People scoff at the word God and higher power, but like, God, alcohol was my higher power. What is a higher power? Something I have a very close relationship with that I will do anything to serve, anything to connect with, anything to get to, Mm -hmm. which I was told, well, start putting that same amount of energy into connecting with God. Mm -hmm. And also what I learned from all my layers of hell is you learn what your false gods or higher powers are when they're no longer available to you. Mm. So I didn't know I was obsessed with my body I certainly started to see it clearly when the body started to change. And I was a size six, then I was a size eight, then I was a size 10. And I was like, I can't live without a thin body. Mm -hmm. I, you know, same with the alcohol. But I needed to lose the things that I believe I need to survive in order to see the truth. And that brings me closer to God. Yeah. I think that's even the case like when someone gets laid off from their job. And all of a Mm. sudden, this thing that defined them, this role, this the title, the salary, and whatever else that comes with it. I just feel completely lost because that was, as you said, their higher power. That was where they found all their value and all their worth. And sometimes I think that being laid off 
is kind of the best gift you could ever get. Because like you said, it exposes where you're putting your value instead of where it should be. Exactly. Like I have a friend now who's the most wonderful woman. She's one of those women, like she's like you. She's one of those women who is really as wonderful as you say. Like she's she's a light. Like I felt like that when I first started talking to you, that you're a light. And mm -hmm. she's like, she's a friend of mine and I hadn't talked to her in a while. And she's, she was already so amazing. And then she's like, oh, we were just talking. And she didn't even mention it. And then said, oh, I've been battling breast cancer. And she's like, yeah, yeah, I had a double mastectomy. I, they're taking my ovaries. They're taking my this. Uh, I'm bald now. And I, I said, I might start crying just because you sound like you're doing amazing. She's like, no, I've had an awakening. She said, I bought this expensive wig. I've never worn it. I don't need it. She said, I've seen how amazing my clients and friends and family are in all of this. And it's brought her to, she talks about higher power now. She's had an awakening that I can't understand because I'm not where she is. And I'm just learning this and trying not to cry. She goes, oh yeah, you'll cry. It's fine. And <laughs> she has this faith that, again, I, I've heard this too from others, like where until you're dying, you don't know what that's like. Where Why do you, are you so peaceful and confident and happy? And anyway, as a friend who's just learning about this, it's hard not to just see the loss. Yeah. Yeah. And she's now in a place where I don't think she'd trade it for mm -hmm. how it was. Be I don't know. But anyway, I just, I see that. And people, when they lose things, amazing awakenings happening happen. And you realize what you don't need and actually can get in the way. Yeah, it's so true. Well, I think our first conversation was like over an hour. And I think I could probably sit here and talk to you all day. <laughs> I just, I love our conversations. And so maybe we're just going to have to have you back in another couple months and we can kind of do an update to the podcast thing, because I just think there's so much wisdom from the path that you've been walking. And I'm sure you're unfolding and unpeeling that onion every day with additional layers as you move through your journey. It's like, you know, our journeys are never really done until God decides our time is up. So yeah. I just really look forward to seeing how how your story is going to impact others and how that's going to unfold in the coming months. It's going to be really, really awesome to see. So yeah, well, thanks. Yeah. You mentioned a few minutes ago about some things that people can do if they're stuck and if they're really feeling like in that hopeless place where they're all alone. And you mentioned maybe reaching out to you. How could people find you if they wanted to connect up with you or maybe listen to your podcast or other things? So yeah, so I'm launching actually in April. Now, I was originally going to launch in February, and I do have a Facebook group, which is How Happiness Repeat. Facebook did take it down when I first created it. So far, it's still there. And then I have Instagram, same How Happiness Repeat. Or you can, in the meantime, use my personal channels, which is Rebecca Gillis. Yeah, and just reach out directly if anyone has questions or is struggling. And over the next few weeks, there'll be some content coming in, and I'd love for people to connect and get their input on on things as I'm launching. So Perfect. Do you do individual coaching as well? I do. Yeah. Yeah. I do individual coaching. So the best way to reach me is through social media sure. as I'm getting my platforms in place. But yeah, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching and so oh. anyone can reach out and it, no matter where their starting point is. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't matter how far from the mark you are. Uh, just exactly. Having a desire to find the mark and get back on it is the all, just the spark to have the desire to get back there is all that's needed. Yeah. And often when I coach people one-on-one, -on -one, it's, they may bring one thing to the session and it becomes something else that they didn't even know was there. And it's beautiful to see where it can start, you know, I'm unmotivated or I'm drinking too much and it turns into grief, mm. this deep grief that's underneath. Mm. And it's amazing. So yeah. definitely reach out and um, I'll be there. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, I will make sure that all that data and the links are in the show notes so people can find you easily because I think you just have such a nice approach to helping other people and making people feel really comfortable. And I'm sure that will come through in, in just how people hear you and see you on the podcast. So thank you so much, Rebecca, for being on the show and just sharing your story with us. And I just cherish your friendship and appreciate you. You too. Thanks so much, Lisa. There's so many great takeaways from this particular interview. I captured nine of them and I'll review them here. One, the hell you're in right now is actually necessary. It will be the catalyst to a whole other life that you can't even imagine is right there waiting for you on the other side. But it's required to go to the depths. Facing those hard feelings and those memories, that is what you actually need for total recovery. Number two, 
How do you build self-esteem? Through esteemable acts. So take good care of yourself. Show up for others. Do the hard work of looking at feelings and thoughts and memories and traumas that you may have just completely pushed out of your mind. Whatever hell you feel like you've gone through is one day going to help somebody who is in that same situation. And in that moment, you will be the only one who can truly understand it. Number three, start putting time and energy into connecting with God. Even if you don't quite understand God or what exactly He is, there is power there to tap into. Draw near to God and He'll draw near to you, says James 4, 8. Ask yourself, which actions am I taking that bring me closer to God? And which actions am I taking that actually bring me away from God? Number four, God cannot remove what you're not ready to let go of. We need to surrender those pains and burdens to God in order to heal. Number five, sin is often correlated with the Bible and faith, but it's actually also an archery term from the ancient Greek language, which means missing the mark. The Bible shows us how to hit the mark and how to live a life that truly does hit the mark. What areas are you maybe missing the mark? When we're hitting the mark, we're clear, trusting, useful, purposeful, and truly connected to ourselves and God. Number six, the past is history. The future is a mystery, but today is a gift. That's why we call it the present. There is such a peace in coming back to the present and knowing what your only role is right now in this moment. And then just relax into that presence. From there, you can operate usefully because the only thing you have control over is right now. Rick Warren reminds us, that while we're great human doings, we're terrible human beings. All too often, we squander the hours we could have lived by worrying about the future we can't control. So let yourself be. Live now in the present moment. Number seven, no one's gonna be good at anything when they first try it. Anything you try for the first time is gonna be pretty much either overwhelming, completely new, foreign, uncomfortable, or you're just not gonna like it. That's what happens when you try something new. If you've ever tried moving into an area that you're uncomfortable with because it's brand new, well, hooray, you've done well. You win. Congratulations for trying something new. And yes, it's supposed to be uncomfortable. That's the point. That is what builds our neural pathways and allows us to grow. Number eight, there is a great awakening happening right now. Look around you. People are awakening to the lies and the propaganda around us. And yet there are a lot of people who are clinging to that desire to stay asleep and just ignore it. Look around, be alert, ask questions, be wise, and get. Number nine, are you stuck? Are you trying the same things over and over again? Yeah, how's that working for you? Whatever addictive behavior you're dealing with, you never have to deal with it again. And you never have to go that journey alone. Yeah, you won't believe it to be true right now, but where you are right now, there are thousands who have been right where you are. And they not only want to help and are willing to help, but it is their greatest joy in life to help. And helping keeps them sober. Helping keeps them recovered. Helping makes their hurts have value. So don't do this alone. Reach out to someone else for some help. Hey, thanks for listening today. If you are dealing with an addiction and you're finding yourself in some version of hell on earth, please reach out for help. Connect with Rebecca, check out the links below here in the show notes and start taking small steps toward God. Small steps of self-care, but do it with somebody who's walked that road and truly understands. You can do what you feel like is the impossible right now. Your life is waiting for you. Don't lose another day. Reach out for help. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and take a quick moment to review it right here wherever you're listening or watching the episode. And finally, stay tuned for more information about my next round of Fast, Pray, Heal, where we learn about the ancient tool of fasting in its various forms and prepare our homes and our mindsets to take on that adventure and conduct a guided fast together as a community as we support each other to find breakthroughs we never realized were possible. What an adventure. For more information about this digital course and to sign up for the waiting list, please head over to my website at lisaroars.com. Thanks again for listening, everyone. God bless and have a great week. Thank you.